Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. And uh, the Bible says that the words of the Lord bless the upright. I pray His words will bless you this morning. I, um, I am in the middle, and in a moment I'll give you the little signal there, unless you, yeah, you're already rolling? Okay, that's better yet. I'm in the middle of sharing a message called the four F's, the four F's, and uh, just, just catch up to speed, um, give you a little introduction. There's a basic formula for living a successful life with God. It's a wonderful pattern repeated throughout the Bible that I call the four F's, and these are four basic practices that are always found working together in the lives of people that walk with God. Uh, in fact, they always work in a particular order, and they don't work apart. They always work together, and one leads to the other. And they are fellowship, focus, function, and fruit. Now, the pattern of the four Fs found throughout Scripture is a group of divinely interconnected laws that will always result in success if you're in your life as you faithfully practice them and live your life walking with God because the four F's are really, as I've discovered, they are the how-to of how to walk with God. How do I take all these things that I've learned in the Old and New Testament and put them into practice in my life? The four F's will grab everything you know about God's Word and put it into a functioning, practical lifestyle so that you can live deliberately rather than accidentally. So we are currently on the topic of um, fellowship with God. And on that subject, I want to talk with you this morning about common union. Say that with me if you would. Common union. union. Now in 1 Corinthians 1 and 9, the scripture says, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And then in 2 Corinthians, Paul goes on and says, The grace, the favor, the spiritual blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the presence and fellowship or the partnership in the Holy Spirit be with you all. So let me begin by saying that fellowship with God begins with having the right perspective and the right attitude. So I'm going to encourage you to let this... Um, foundational thought be the one that you build your life upon. Taking from those two verses, combining them together, here's a simple thought that could be the fundamental uh, platform that you build your life on. And it's simple. God is calling me into fellowship with himself and he wants my company. God is calling me into fellowship with himself and he wants my company. I think if you were to memorize that and those two verses I gave you, they would answer a lot of questions and knock down a lot of the accusations that the devil raises up against us in the course of a day. So fellowship with God, though, can't remain just simply an attitude. At some point, it's got to turn into an action and become communion or common union. And that's where we get that's where we get common union from, communion. And communion, in its simple definition, is a union between the characteristics of God and the characteristics of man that we share in common together. So that <clears throat> communion could be described in familiar phrases that we use, such as sharing heart-to-heart -heart conversation. So think Whatever are the characteristics of God and what are the human characteristics of man, they link up, they match up. And so those phrases like sharing heart-to-heart -heart conversation, they speak about common union. Or seeing eye-to-eye, -eye, common union. Being of the same mind, common union. Or experiencing shared affection, 
etc. Common union. So in other words, when our human elements, vision, speech, imagination, and desire, come into alignment with the corresponding master elements of God from which they were fashioned, we have common union with God or communion. So you understand we were made in the image and likeness of God. Everything about you corresponds with something about God. And communion is when you match up those common characteristics, mind to mind, eye to eye, heart to heart. So if you want to experience the heart of God, for example, if you want to know the mind of God, if you want to see His vision or speak with His authority, then your own heart, mind, imagination, and mouth must become yielded to Him in common union. So at some point, we have to go from the academic to the functioning, to the fellowship. The common union or communion with God is where all that's worked out. So what are we talking about? We're talking about prayer. Common union happens in prayer. So when the disciples saw Jesus opening the eyes of the blind, performing miracles, casting out demons, and they were absolutely amazed, and they, they listened as he explained how or why he was doing that, Jesus would always point to his communion with the Father. He would say, I'm doing nothing but what I have seen my Father do. I got up early in the morning and I was praying, or I stayed up all night, I was seeking the Lord up on the side of a mountain, and got up in the morning and I went out into the town and village, and when I am opening the eyes of the blind or healing the cripple or casting out demons, I'm simply doing what I saw my Father doing in prayer. So when the disciples understood that Jesus explained his miracles by pointing to communion, they didn't say to him, hey, teach us how to do that. They didn't say, teach us how to uh, make miracles. How do you do that? Instead, what they asked was, Lord, teach us how to pray. When they saw the miracles and they understood that they were the result of communion, they said, Teach us how to fellowship with the Father the way you fellowship with the Father. And so Jesus taught them how to pray. And his prayer model, we call the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer, his prayer model taught them not only how to enter common union with God. If you break that prayer down, and I sure hope you have, and if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do it. Because when they ask the specific question, Lord, teach us. How do we know the Father the way you know the Father? He gave them a specific answer. And you cannot plumb the depths of the wisdom and power in that our Father who is in heaven, sacred is your name. Each one of those phrases itself opens a book of thought and idea and revelation. And so the Lord didn't say pray this prayer he said, here's the model. Now you stretch your own words, your own heart over the framework of this prayer and you will learn common union with God. You will come to learn the Father. You will understand what God is. And so when Jesus taught them how to pray, how to commune with God, he was really in effect teaching them how to be holy. How to be holy. You know, there's been more strife and there's probably more people that are no longer in church fellowshipping the, with the Lord because of misunderstanding about holiness and how we, when we miss what holiness really is and we go about to establish a kind of a religious uh, a form of holiness, when we get holiness wrong, we impose a religious concept of holiness on people one that is impossible to bear up under, and number two, one that does not connect you with God. It just simply makes you acceptable among religious people. It drives more people away from God. It becomes a stumbling block. It becomes a, well, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you tie burdens onto people that are impossible to bear, but my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come and learn of me. So 
when Jesus taught how to pray, how to have common union, he was really teaching you'll learn how to be holy. And not only learn how to be holy, <clears throat> when you enter common union with God, you'll become holy. It will have that effect on you. It will turn you into a holy person. Now, your friends may not recognize you and say, oh, here comes Mark, the holy man. They may not say, oh, well, Mark became holy all of a sudden. Um, it's not that kind of a thing. But the Lord will show up in his life because God works holiness into us. Now, if we're going to have fellowship with God or common union, the first thing we have to understand is that we have to come out of the unholy world and the unholy manner of thinking and living and, and uh, 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 conducting our lives into a place where we can connect, that connectivity, that ability to line up, to sync up, if you will, uh, to come into alignment with God. God condescended into this world in Jesus Christ, but he never left holiness. He was holy the whole time, right? And so holiness is possible in this world, but we have to get into that place. Hebrews 12 and 14 says, Pursue peace with everybody and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And so, you know, sometimes the church gives birth to peace movements and they like to run around and, and, and uh, receive praise and acclaim from an unbelieving society because they're involved in the work of peace. But uh, if, if there's not holiness in your life, no one's going to see the Lord. And ultimately, if people don't see Jesus, they're not going to get saved. If you and I don't see the Lord, we're not going to have access to him. Jesus put it like this, <clears throat> so simple. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It really isn't that what holiness is, the ability to see God. The unholy mind cannot perceive God. Unholy eyes cannot see God. Unholy heart cannot hold God. No faith that can connect with God can come out of an unholy mind, unholy heart. So it's important that we experience that holiness. And holiness, most of you know holiness <clears throat> means to be separate. But I like to take it a step further and say that holiness really means otherness. To be other than creation or perfect objectivity. When Jesus walked the treacherous paths and roads of this life with people plotting against him and wondering where everyone was coming from and people having their agendas and, and all of those different things. How did he keep all that straight? How was he able to walk in the perfect love of God? Was he constantly strategizing? If I say this, they'll say that. Was he, was he constantly figuring out where are people coming from? He spent time in prayer. And when he came out of prayer, he was in the Father's presence. And the Father led him. And he did only what the Father... He didn't worry about where are people coming from and uh, what if there's a trap? You know, they're just imposing this uh, question on me for some ulterior motive. Holiness comes out of spending the right kind of time in fellowship with God. And then when you're done with that kind of direct praying, you continue to pray without ceasing by walking in the presence of the Lord and in consciousness towards the Lord. So the pure in heart shall see God. And that's what we want. We want to see God. We want to see him in our heart. We want to see him manifest in our life. How many of you would say this morning, I want to see God manifest in my life? Common union or communion or fellowship with God. We're layering all three of those. Fellowship, communion, common union. I'm using the term common union because I gave you a little illustration so you understand we're not talking about fellowship. That's not just a mental thing. It's an activity. It's an action. So common union is the only place in which the Holy Spirit will reveal the Father to you. In order for God to reveal the Father to you or for the, you to see God, you have to come to a certain place. In the Old Testament, they had to go up on a mountain, for example, or they had to go into the Holy of Holies. You couldn't just see God anywhere. You had to get to a certain position. 
And that position in the Old Testament physically was indicative of the fact or of the idea that we must be lifted up into a place of holiness, which is out of unholiness. And that is why communion with God is the only place where you can truly see Him. You can hear Him preached on a Sunday. You can see the evidence of God in answered prayers or miracles. But for you to really see Him, behold Him, for your eyes to drink Him in, for your ears to hear the Word of God and the Spirit of God enter your life, for you to see here and to receive from Him, it takes being in common union. That's the only place where He is revealed. And for that, I'd like to offer to you Proverbs 8 and 17, which says, God speaking, I love those that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. So God is wanting you to find him. And more importantly, to be saved, God must be found. We must find him. So those that seek me early will find me. Communion begins early in the morning. I can't stress that enough. Just here's some practical tips for you. If you want to have common union with God, you may have to change some of your habits, some of you, and I know it's not easy. And the, and the Lord is not a legalist. These are basic principles that you want to apply to your life. Um, if you can't do them exactly the way I express them, ask the Lord to show you how you can apply them to your life. But at least grasp the principle that communion or common union starts early. Amen. Those who seek me early there's a reason for that. Jesus said sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We all know that it takes about five to six minutes for the devil to jump into the middle of your day, grab you, and he's off on a tear, running wild through the world, bumping and dragging behind him. And the whole time you're thinking, i got to stop and pray at some point. But it's 10 o'clock at night before you finally collapse and go, well, I, that was a horrible day. It's terrible. I wish I could have that day back again. <laughs> so here's what I'd like to recommend. Set a holy place for yourself to meet with God. You might have a couple of them. But Jesus always withdrew to go pray. He went somewhere secluded. That means praying while you're watching the news is not going to produce common union. Now, I know that some of you have to make some adaptations, particularly some of you young moms that have got kids, and you might need to, like, find your nap time or, you know, keep the monitor on while you're praying, but you get the general idea. Carve out a holy place. Kathy and I have our holy place in our homes that we go to, our home that we go to. We're not living in separate houses. Um, <laughs> And uh, you have to be careful. People hear these messages and they go, well, guess, get on the phone with one another. Guess what? So you want to you sanctify a place that's your place to meet in. Um, could be your living room, bedroom, somewhere that you can get alone and push everything else out. Close the door and sit down. And the first thing to do is get your Bible out and just read the Word. Find some sort of, you know, uh, uh, reading through the scriptures pattern. If you're not good at picking one out, maybe start with the Gospels. Read a, go read a chapter a day out of the Gospels and then add a proverb. Read a chapter in Proverbs. Put those two together. It's a nice start. And uh, just take it a step at a time. But what you're doing is you're getting your mind focused on the Lord, letting his word. When you're reading, the Holy Spirit is taking you out of the rat race and he's calming you down, and he's getting you focused on the Lord. And then all those anxious things, when you rush into your prayer closet, you probably have some emergencies going on. Oh, God, I need to talk to you about this, this situation. And the Lord says, just calm down, open my word, get your mind settled, because it's not going to be any good if I've got you frantic. See, I, I want you to be able to receive. And so you read the word. I, I, I'm a... I always advocate find a great devotional everybody loves. Um, Kathy, what are some of the Andrew Murray, um, 
Oswald Chambers, um, there's tons of them. Hey, the morning light, the light wash path. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yes, praise God, they're out there. There's lots of them. Um, so the Holy Spirit will focus your mind. Then, the, you know, two years ago in our 21-day fast in January, the Lord, uh, the Lord made a little adjustment in my prayer life. And I tell you, I just want to share it with you because it's, I, I, think it, I think it'll bless any one of us. And um, I used to just go right into prayer because I know how to pray. You know, and I use the structure of the Our Father prayer, Our Father in Heaven. I've got my own words, my own way of expressing it, but my mind goes through that, that process. You know, your kingdom come, your will be done, and, and each of those steps. And I used to just get right into it and prayed. But after reading the Word and everything, God dealt with me during that time of fasting, and He said, Psalm 46 says, one of my favorite verses, it took me so many years to finally put it into practice, be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted in the earth. Sometimes we're overly anxious in our prayer, trying too hard to get God to address a situation. God already knows the situation, and the first thing for us to do is to get still and be still, and then just let your mind focus on God, Jesus. Just focus, just know that He is God, and then the Holy Spirit will come along. And so I got my, I get in my living room. Uh, it's been a couple of years now, and, but it's just wonderful. And I just get down on my knees. You don't have to be on your knees. I kind of like standing in attention on my knees. But uh, I, I just get on my knees and just, sta just stand there on my knees before the Lord. And I don't move. I don't say anything. I just get still and I just wait. Because he's there in the stillness. And the Holy Spirit, after I've read the word, I just still myself before God. The Holy Spirit, every single time a thought rises from the word, something he's spoken to me. Um, we eat so fast we don't digest. That's why we have gas. That's why we put on weight. That's why we got digestive issues. Same thing spiritually. We gobble up sermons, uh, we gobble up scriptures, we race through our devotionals, but we don't digest it. We don't sit and let it absorb into our heart. The Bible says the Holy Spirit's supposed to be your teacher. You're le learning things and it's all up here in your mind, but how much of what's up here in your mind have you let the Holy Spirit take piece by piece Take it down into your heart, plant it in your heart, explain to you what it means in a way that's really personal and significant and meaningful to you. And that's what the Father wants to do. So I got very still and I just wait. And then that note the Holy Spirit gives me just kind of gives me my focus. And then I start. I run through that Our Father model. The Lord meets me in it. And I'll tell you, I usually don't get past hallowing in the sacred name of Jesus. By the time I'm done exalting his name, reminding myself of what his name means, my requests are all answered. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. I usually don't get past the name. And he has answered it all. He's dealt with it. And I, and I usually have to say to the Lord, yeah, yeah but Lord, um, you know, I... I uh, I just want to say, uh, to you be all the glory and the power now and forever. Amen. You know, get, just got to get that in there. So then when you get up from that prayer and you have to go out into your day, take that presence with you. Don't break the connection. Amen. Common union. And the way to do it, thanksgiving. Am I right, Kath? Thanksgiving. The way to not to say amen but not stop praying is to give thanks and keep giving thanks. Just give thanks throughout the day and you and the Holy Spirit will stay in communion. Amen. That's right. All right. That's worth the price of your offering right there. So at any rate, um, I'd like to kind of just bring this down to a final focus. Um, if you're going to have common union with God, God is a very broad, ambiguous word. And 
I think a lot of people, you know, everyone has their own idea of what God is. And so <clears throat> I think it's important that we let truth with a capital T define what God is and, and not just carry childhood or manufactured images of what God is when we fellowship with him. Some of our, some of our imagery and some of our thoughts about God are immature or out of balance. I believe that the Lord gave me that simple, those simple verses that define Jesus as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as the apex, the zenith, the culmination that defines who He is. He is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So I'm gonna, I want to bring this message down on this point. Um, in Mark's gospel, the first, first chapter, verse 22, um, Jesus has gone into the synagogue. He's healed people. He's gotten up. He's preached out of Isaiah. And the people in the synagogue are stunned. They're stunned by what they've heard. They're stunned by what they've seen. Um, Jesus is carrying a presence about him. Nobody they have ever seen walking the face of the earth has got. And the scripture says, the people were amazed by his teaching because he taught them like one who had authority and not like the experts of the law. That last statement is so instructional. He taught with authority, not like the theologians. And there's so much to be said about that, I can't really go into it. I just want you to think about the contrast between what was different with their authority and the authority that Jesus came with. Because Jesus came down off the mountain after a night of prayer in communion with God, and he walked in, and when he opened his mouth, authority spoke on every level. So let me just simply say this. Communion or common union with Jesus connects you with his authority. Let me say it again. Common union with Jesus is how you gain the authority of God in your life. You could be saved 30, 40, 50 years and know a lot and not be walking in any kind of measurable authority. You just can amaze people by your testimonies and, oh, I saw this and, oh, I remember that and, oh, this happened once upon a time and, uh, oh, I know all these things. And people could be amazed, but God is not amazed. Nobody's getting saved off of that stuff. It's not moving any mountains. Nothing is really happening through all that. The only thing that makes a change in this world that, that can take a sinner from darkness and bring him into the kingdom of God is the authority, the authority of, of Jesus, the power and authority. So common union with him is what connects you with his authority. Do you really need more of God's authority moving in your life? And you must, I can't tell you that. You must be honest with yourself. We can all stand more of his authority, but, but maybe this morning as you listen to the last part of this message, you want to think about yourself and say, am I dangerously low? You know how when you're driving and the needle is kind of in the red? Am I dangerously low? When's the last time the authority of God really showed up in my life? When's the last time I spoke or did something and the power of God backed me up? And as a believer, we should be carrying that mantle of the Lord's authority. So I, I want you to want the authority of God. And so I'm telling you that only common union with Him can fill that tank back up where God's authority is in your life. Here's a practical how-to. Bringing your stewardships, your marriage is a stewardship, your job's a stewardship, your ministry is a stewardship, your relationships, the basic sphere of the influence of your life, your name, your reputation, your behavior, all of those things are the various levels of the stewardship of your life, the stewardships, plural, of your life. So bringing the stewardships of your life into common union with Jesus puts you in the chain of command under the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it allows His authority to be manifest in your life. 
So what does common union with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords make you? If you come in to communion with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, what does it do to you? What does it turn you into? What are you when you are in communion with King of Kings, Lord of Lords? Do you get the question? What position does it put you in? Your fellowship with Jesus brings all things in your life into common union with God. If you look at your life and you say, this area of my life's out of control. I need to, I need to, I need to get, get a reboot, a restart in this area of my life. Every area of your life can come under the dominion of the Lord Jesus, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that happens in communion or common union with him. The more you walk in common union with God, the more it draws the stewardships of your life in under his authority. Then when you're walking in common union with God, you can then refuse to enter negotiations with the devil regarding your life. You know, the devil's always negotiating with you over your life. How much are you going to be willing to let me have? And we enter negotiation with him because we lack authority. We allow the devil to negotiate with us. We don't want to admit it. And I think the biggest deception that a Christian can walk in is to not face the fact that you've been negotiating with the devil. You have settled certain cases he's brought against you. But God's will is that you don't ever settle with the devil on anything that you never even negotiate with him. You don't let him negotiate with you. When you come into common union with God, you don't have to negotiate with the devil anymore because everything in your life that he could possibly get into and mess up has now been brought into the kingdom of God and it's under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, I'm including myself, I put myself at the head of this line, should ask ourselves this morning, what is it about my life that is not directly under the authority and the umbrella of the kingdom of God? What is the devil messing with that I can't seem to deal with? Because managing the territory of your life with the Lord's authority brings your life into his kingdom and it makes you it makes you one of the reasons why Jesus is called King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Did you catch that? Amen. You become one of the reasons Hallelujah. that he's King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He wants his kingship, his lordly accountability and, and the way he conducts his authority to be manifest through your life. It can't happen if you don't have a life of prayer. It can't happen if you're not walking in common union with the Lord. So get in common union with Jesus and let him settle every claim the devil makes against your life. Amen? Close your Bible and stand with me this morning.